Mr. Ralph Cosa of the Pacific Forum of uh, CSIS. You can read his bio on your agenda and program. However, what I'd like to say is that he is a recognized expert in matters affecting the Asia Pacific region. And one of the reasons why he's here today is to encourage dialogue. Uh, we know that sometimes we have a chance to uh, sit in these forums and learn something new. Sometimes we remember something old. And what Mr. Costa does is he provides a forum for these kinds of opportunities to just get together and have frank and candid discussion. Uh, what, what we enjoy about these forums is getting to know the people who are doing the thinking and speaking. And so I hope you take a little bit of time as you're eating and finish your meal, please do at your leisure, to get to know Mr. Ralph Costa. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Anya Hasayo and aloha. Uh, delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about the Pacific Forum and then uh, go into my uh, remarks. The Pacific Forum is a foreign policy think tank. We're affiliated with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, but it's a homegrown Hawaii organization uh, founded by a retired admiral named Joe Vasey in 1975. Uh, Joe is now a little over 100 years old. Uh, I still get emails from him a couple of times a week reminding me about his new strategy for dealing with North Korea and, and other things. Uh, but when he was a submariner during World War II, during a particularly uh, tense moment when his submarine was being attacked and depth chargers were going around and they were being forced to come to the surface, their diesel sub was running out of air, he said, if I live through this, I'm going to find a better way of handling disputes than people dropping bombs on one another. Uh, he fortunately did live through it, and uh, he remembered that pledge, and that's what the Pacific Forum was, uh, was founded for. Uh, we are nonpartisan. Uh, a very wise uh, man once told me that when it comes to foreign policy, uh, you have to start from where you are. Uh, I know there are many people in this room that wish that the political situation in the South Korea was different. Uh, there are some Americans who wish the political situation in the U.S. was different. Uh, but when we wake up in the morning, we have President Trump and we have President Moon, and our job is to try to, in that circumstance, try to help create the best possible policies uh, and to start from where we are, and that's what we, we try to do. I want to talk uh, primarily about North Korea. Uh, I'm not a North Korea expert. Uh, anyone who claims to be is either fooling you or fooling themselves. Uh, when it comes to North Korea, we're all guessing. Uh, I consider myself a student of North Korea, and I'll allow you to give me a grade uh, when I'm done speaking to you, whether or not I'm, I'm a passing student or a failing student. Uh, but we're all guessing. Uh, but the one thing I do know about North Korea uh, is that the leadership is not crazy. Uh, people want to write off, well, this is just a, you know, a, some crazy guy. Uh, North Korea has been a failed state uh, run by a, a family dynasty for the last 70 plus years uh, that has managed to survive, not necessarily to thrive, but to survive uh, by masterfully playing nations against one another. They played China against the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union went away, they brought the U.S. in. They play South Korea against itself. And they try to play the U.S. against China and against Russia. And uh, they are master manipulators. So we shouldn't lose sight of, of two things. The real threat is North Korea. Uh, and they are not crazy. Uh, when we say that Kim Jong-un is irrational, what we're really saying is we don't understand his rationale. Uh, no one, no leader, does anything that they think is irrational. So when, they, when North Korea does something, we have to ask ourselves, why does Kim Jong-un think that what he is doing is rational? Uh, and the simple answer, for the most part, is because it's worked. 
uh, because he's managed to use his only export, which is threats, uh, to their advantage. Uh, I joke that their, their strategy is stop or I'll shoot. And we just don't know how to deal with that, that kind of a strategy. Not that we wouldn't like him to shoot, but the splatter effect would be very dangerous. And that splatter effect is Seoul and 25 million South Koreans within artillery range. Let's forget about nuclear weapons, just within artillery range. So that's, that's the real danger. So what are the North Koreans up to? Again, we're all guessing. So here's, I'll give you my guess. Uh, the North Koreans are playing today an extremely dangerous game. Uh, for years, I mentioned they've sort of played people against one another. Right now, they are trying to create a circumstance where the U.S. will be forced to have only two choices. And those two choices will be accept North Korea as a nuclear weapon state with a military capable of striking the U.S. mainland or go to war. And he's betting that the idea of war on the peninsula is so abhorrent that we will have to choose the other. That's our dilemma. Uh, the real dilemma is if we go with the first option, it won't make things better because the day that North Korea has that kind of a capability, it becomes an even more dangerous state. So we are literally facing a lose-lose situation. As I said, that's our dilemma. But North Korea has a dilemma as well. Kim Jong-un has promised his people both nuclear weapons and economic development. Uh, our policy has been to force him to choose between one or the other. Uh, but right now, he hasn't had to choose. Uh, he's been able to have modest economic development and still keep his, his, his weapon program. A lot of people now are talking about the, some idea about a freeze, uh, but we have to ask ourselves, freeze what? Uh, there is a distinct difference, a profound difference between rewarding North Korea for good behavior, which is verifiable steps toward complete, irreversible, comprehensive, nuclear disarmament and rewarding North Korea for the absence of bad behavior. Uh, this is all people are talking about right now is to reward for the absence of bad behavior. In other words, if you stop doing what the UN has already prohibited you from doing, launching missiles, testing nuclear weapons, somehow or other we will reward you. But if we buy into that, he still continues, the centrifuges still keep spinning, the rocket scientists still keep perfecting the rocket engines and the motors even without a test. So we essentially allow him to do both. Uh, and this is the real danger. Uh, this is the danger that I think we need to be talking with both the US government and the South Korean government about to not fall for this trap because we can't have both economic development and nuclear development. We've got to force North Korea to make a choice. Uh, is that easy? No. Uh, if somebody knew how to do that easily, there'd be a Nobel Prize waiting for them. I'd, I'd sign up for that myself. Uh, but is it impossible? Uh, I don't know. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know. I don't think so. I hope not. Uh, and I think we need to try to find out. Now, the U.S. policy today, U.S. policy today is we want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses without bringing him to his knees. I question whether or not anything short of bringing him to his knees will bring him to his senses. Uh, and that's the real challenge, I think, that we face today. Uh, Without Chinese assistance, uh, this would be extremely difficult. Uh, I somewhat sarcastically uh, 
define U.S.-China relations today as the U.S. has decided to not accuse China of doing what China is not doing, which is currency manipulation, and in return, China is pretending to help us with North Korea. And the two sides have declared this as a win-win. Well, I think Mr. Trump's tweets of the last few days have discovered that China is not uh, capable. Uh, I would modify that to say they're not willing uh, to do that. Can we do it alone? Uh, it'll be a lot harder. Uh, but there are, I think, a number of steps that the U.S. can do to help bring North Korea, quote, to its senses. Uh, this requires much more significant sanctions than we've had in the past. Uh, it requires secondary sanctions against Chinese entities that are keeping North Korea on life support. Uh, I have told uh, my Chinese colleagues that instead of building a wall uh, along uh, the river, they should be building refugee camps. Uh, I've met with the North Koreans two or three times a year for the last dozen years. Uh, the North Koreans believe that China needs them more than they need China. Uh, and everything China does reinforces that message. So until China can shock them into actually believing that China is prepared to let them fail, uh, the Chinese leverage is squandered. Uh, so I think part of our challenge is to persuade China that it actually needs to take things more seriously uh, and that they can't have what China wants, which is regional stability, uh, as long as you have a North Korea with nuclear weapons. Uh, in the meantime, I think there are many steps, as I just mentioned, that the U.S. needs to be doing, should pursue doing, in, in order to put that kind of pressure uh, that's necessary on, on the Kim Jong-un regime. Uh, one thing we should not be doing uh, is playing into the North's desire to have both nuclear policies and economic development. Uh, we should promise them a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but to get to the end of the rainbow, they've got to start moving in the right direction. My own personal view, uh, doing things like reopen, reopening Kaesong at this point would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, first of all, it violates all the UN sanctions, uh, which uh, should mean something, and we are nations that believe in the rule of law. Uh, secondly, it would allow the North Koreans to put their nuclear and testing programs, the lack of bad behavior aside, in order to convince the North Korean people that they can have both. Uh, and that, I think, undermines our policy. So, in my view, the, the Obama administration, uh, for all of its faults, and I think it had some in dealing with North Korea, had the basic fundamental right, uh, and that's that in order, you can't just have talks for the sake of having talks. Uh, you've got to have enough pressure on North Korea that they make that strategic choice to give up nuclear weapons in order to survive. Uh, and we have not gotten there yet. I think uh, the Trump administration, while being extremely critical of the Obama administration, has actually adopted the very same policy. Uh, they just call it strategic impatience rather than strategic patience, but it's still based on applying sufficient pressure uh, in order to force North Korea to give up its nuclear program and, and to open up. Uh, the North Koreans, of course, have, have read the book. Uh, they saw what happened in Eastern Europe uh, when communist societies opened up. Uh, so they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, if, if you will. They understand the real dangers of having North Koreans be exposed to what's happening in the South. Uh, but we need to make sure we don't play into that narrative. Uh, so I would hope uh, that this very, very important summit meeting that's coming up next week uh, between uh, President Moon and President Trump, uh, that we establish some important basic fundamentals uh, in how to deal with North Korea. Now, one of those has to be no economic assistance to North Korea until there are legitimate, verifiable moves toward moving toward denuclearization. Again, stopping testing 
that's pausing bad behavior. It's not good behavior. It's not something that should be rewarded. So I think that's going to be the real challenge. Now, fortunately, North Korea will probably help us uh, in this regard. Uh, so far, uh, you can sort of draw a parallel between President Obama's offer to reach out an open hand to anyone who would unclench their fist eight years ago, and you'll recall he was met with a table dong launch and then a nuclear test. Uh, so far, President Moon's overtures have resulted in more missile tests and a refusal of humanitarian assistance. If the North Koreans are as predictable as I think they actually are, uh, we will see some more nuclear, uh, more missile tests, maybe even a nuclear test, a day before the Moon-Trump summit. Uh, so they will help, I think, to force the two leaders uh, to continue to play uh, a much harder line policy than perhaps either one of them want to. But I think our responsibility as citizens of both countries uh, is to continue to send a consistent message to our national leaders to essentially don't fall for the North Korean tricks. Let's not play the same game over and over and over again. Uh, the view, don't buy the same horse twice. We've actually bought the horse three or four times. Let's not buy it a fifth time. Uh, and this time, insist on verifiable measures before we provide any type of economic assistance. I also think, and I, I will end on this note, uh, that we cannot forget the tragic death of Otto Warmbier. Uh, and I would hope that meetings like this uh, would at least include, at the end of their findings, a very strong condemnation of that North Korean behavior and a call, as I hope our two presidents will call, for a release of all political prisoners from North Korea, not just the three remaining Americans who are Korean Americans, uh, but all political prisoners. And I think that should be our, our likely demand. We cannot let this poor young man die in vain. So let me stop at that point. Uh, hopefully I've stimulated some questions. I'm more interested in hearing your comments and questions, so uh, I will open the floor up for discussion, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kosa. So <clears throat> again, it's a frank and open dialogue. And as Mr. Kosa said, the floor is open. We have a few minutes for questions and answers. Please take the mic. Oh, could I do this here? I... Just say it loud so everyone can hear. Okay. Um, since uh, North Korea is a dynasty, and we have a lot of policy and treaty, I was wondering uh, if you think how long this dynasty will last and how much the North Koreans want a bloodline continuance because, you know, there's no peaceful transition of yeah. power, so I'm just wondering how stable this government is. Right. The, the question, if you, if you couldn't hear it, essentially was how, how stable uh, the North Korean government is, uh, a government that is based uh, on, not on merit, but on heredity. Uh, it's, of course, uh, a, I, don't, I don't normally refer to North Korea as a communist society. I think it's more a feudal dictatorship. Uh, and the real problem uh, in trying to analyze what's happening in North Korea, quite frankly, is that every event you can come up with two equally plausible, diametrically opposed explanations. So when, when Kim Jong-un put his uncle to death, some Korea experts said, this shows how secure he is. Uh, he is now so secure, has such a grasp on power that he is prepared and willing to remove the people that his father had put in place to advise him. Others said, this shows how insecure he is, uh, where he was so afraid of an alternate power base that he had to put his own uncle to death rather than just sort of remove him. Which is the real answer? I don't know. My guess is the latter, uh, that he's insecure. Uh, and I would reinforce that argument by him putting his half-brother to death. 
Uh, it was very clear that his half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, had no desire to ever run North Korea. Uh, the only thing he wanted to run is the blackjack tables in Macau. So uh, to, to feel the necessity to put his, his own half-brother to death says that he was paranoid, uh, that he's very concerned about alternative sources of power. That's my best guess. Uh, but if, in fact, that's true, that gives us some idea as to how we should be responding to him. Uh, we should be talking about a North Korean government in exile, perhaps based around Kim Jong-nam's son, wherever he happens to be hiding. And I'm sure he's hiding, and I'm sure he should be hiding. Uh, just to sort of increase that, that concern and that uncertainty. Uh, what I do know for uh, as close as we can come to fact in guessing about North Korea uh, is it will be very difficult for there to be some type of conspiracy within North Korea against him. Why? Because brothers don't even trust brothers. Uh, this is a society where a mother will turn her child in in order to get protection and not be implicated. So if anyone ever shoots Kim Jong-un, uh, it's going to be a single shooter acting alone, in my guess, uh, more than it's going to be some homegrown conspiracy. Uh, but I think there are ways that you can try to convince the elite in North Korea uh, who today believe that their best hope for their own personal future and well-being is keeping the Kim regime in power. Uh, if you can convince the elite in North Korea that this is their greatest likelihood of disaster, both personally and as a nation, uh, then maybe you will encourage that single shooter, or you will encourage someone, or you will at least force Kim Jong-un to rethink the path that he's on, uh, which is what everyone uh, wants him to do. So I, I know that's not a, a complete answer, but uh, we're all guessing, and, and it's, it's very hard to tell. My own guess is I think they are insecure, uh, but a U.S. policy based on hoping that North Korea will collapse uh, is not going to get us anywhere. Uh, if we believe that they're that vulnerable, then we need to do things to exploit that uh, and if we don't believe it, then we need to do things to create that. Thank you. Sure. Please make sure if you want to ask a question, you come to the mic so that everyone can hear your question. It does, it does help uh, keep the dialogue going. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Casey Kim. I have a question on your intelligent guess on how Mr. Trump may handle Moon's visit to the United States next week when Mr. Trump, he invited Xi Jinping of China while he was entertained and talked about and, and all that, uh, US military striked uh, Syria where uh, Russia was providing the umbrella for and the US-Russia relationship happens to be friendlier than more hostile and shows some signal. Being said, that being said, how would you guess Mr. Trump uh, handling yeah. Moon's visit to the United States? Good. I, I should cop out by saying I'm a foreign policy expert, so I try to predict what the other guy is going to do and not my own president, because he's much more unpredictable and, in fact, prides himself on, on being unpredictable. We'll recall that he said he thought American policy was too predictable, uh, and he has certainly lived up to that, that particular observation. Uh, it worries me sometimes that I think uh, Mr. Trump scares our allies more than he scares our potential adversaries, and I think we still need to sort of work on, on that balance. Uh, I don't think uh, that he will use the opportunity uh, of dinner with President Moon to launch strikes against North Korea, if that's what you're aiming at or hoping for. Uh, there's a big difference, of course, between North Korea's ability to retaliate and uh, Syria's. Uh, the, the reality is the Syrian government crossed a clear red line. Uh, and uh, it was a red line that had initially been established by the US government. Uh, and then we had backed away from it. But we had backed away from it 
in return for Syrian government doing certain things. And one of those was getting rid of all of its chemical weapons. And clearly they had not done that. Uh, so I, I think that there was both a moral and a legal justification for Mr. Trump to do what he did as far as ordering uh, those strikes. Uh, we are not at the point, I believe, uh, where in good conscience uh, you could authorize strikes against North Korea, uh, particularly if you understand that there is a greater possibility of some type of retaliatory action. Uh, and again, uh, there are 25 million of South Koreans, 40 plus million residents that are within artillery range of of, of North Korea, so I, I think you have to be uh, a bit more careful there. I do think, uh, and I hope, uh, that uh, the two presidents will sort of, at the 60,000 foot level, uh, establish the basic parameters of, of a mutual policy going forward toward North Korea, and that one of those will be uh, a joint agreement to continue pressuring North Korea uh, until such time as they are legitimately and verifiably prepared uh, to start denuclearization. Uh, and I think we're still a long ways away from that, as I mentioned. I would hope we could also take some issues off the table. Uh, I would hope that the two presidents will agree to, quote, review or, quote, look at chorus rather than saying we need to renegotiate our free trade agreement. Uh, that was a flippant comment on a tweet by the president, and I'm sure he was thinking of other things when, when he said it, but I think that would be a disaster uh, if we were to start focusing on the Korea free trade agreement as, as a test of the alliance solidarity. And in fact, the, the chorus agreement, I think, is working for everybody, and we need to we need to keep that intact. Uh, the THAAD issue is another uh, serious concern. Uh, my own recommendation, not that anyone's gonna follow this, but my own recommendation would be for the two presidents to agree that THAAD is a temporary measure. Uh, that THAAD is necessary until Korea develops its own Korean air defense system, uh, which is, by most accounts, 15 years away, uh, 10 years away, uh, and that it's a temporary condition until the North Korean missile threat goes away. And remembering that a freeze does not make the threat go away. Uh, a, a removal of missile capabilities uh, makes the threat go away. And, and then I would hope uh, that after President Trump and President Moon shake hands on that, uh, that President Moon, the following week when he goes to China, uh, tells President Xi uh, that as president of South Korea, I have a moral responsibility, a moral responsibility to protect the Korean people and to protect the American people who are risking their lives to defend the Korean people. And as a result, I would appreciate it if China didn't interfere in South Korea's internal affairs. Uh, Again, I can dream. I'm not sure that will, that second part will happen, but that's, in my view, what should happen. Uh, uh, I'm, I think I could characterize most quote-unquote experts or specialists on U.S.-Korea relations are see the, see the summit as necessary uh, because we have to have some type of basic parameters on, on the relationship going forward with two new leaders. Uh, but also, both of them are very nervous uh, because something either one could say might set uh, the other one off. Uh, but people were very nervous uh, before Trump met with Mr. Abe, and that turned out pretty well. Uh, and they were pretty nervous when he met with Xi Jinping. Uh, and uh, at least from a Chinese perspective, it turned out pretty well. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, from a US perspective, it will turn out well as well. At least we don't have a trade war going on with China and, and an openly hostile relationship. Although, as I inferred in my comments, I don't think China has done enough uh, and hasn't been prepared to do enough to actually help us with North Korea 
And I think we still need to keep the pressure on China to do that. So I hope that got to your question. I know I rambled on a bit, but it's good. Thank we you. have time for one more question. Mr. Kosa, thank you very much for uh, uh, these great remarks and this engaging conversation. Yeah. One more. Fabulous. Thank you, Mr. Kosa, for uh, your remarks today and for the question and answer period. Good. Really if, appreciate the time if, you spent today. If I could make one closing comment, uh, if you're interested in being on the Pacific Forum's <coughs> mailing list, uh, Dana, where are you? Stand up, wave your hand. Uh, either give myself or Dana a copy of your email address and we're happy to put you on our mailing list for our commentaries and uh, we welcome the opportunity to interact with you further. So thank you very much. Kamsamnida. <laughs>